Great. So today we're in the, the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. What do you get when you combine a librarian and a lawyer? You get a wealth of knowledge that doesn't make any sense to you. Okay, here's another one. There's a preacher that thought that it would be good to use an illustration before the congregation as he was getting up that Sunday morning to bring out a point. So what he did was he took four worms and he took one worm and he put it in a jar of alcohol. He took another worm and he placed it in a jar filled with cigarette smoke. Then he took another worm and he put it in a jar that was filled up with chocolate. Then he took the fourth worm and he put it in a jar that was filled with good, rich soil. So then the preacher went along and he taught his sermon and at the end of the sermon, he brought back up the four jars and they looked inside the jar and the first jar where the worm was in alcohol, the worm was dead. The second jar where the worm was placed in cigarette smoke, that worm was dead. The third jar that had the worm with a, a lot of chocolate, that worm was dead also. But then he took the fourth jar where the worm had been placed in good soil. When he held it up, the worm had lived the best life that a worm could ever live. He was so happy and rejoicing. So the pastor, he turned around and he said out to the congregation, he says, now by this demonstration, what could you say that you learned from this? A little old lady in the back of the church stood up. She says, well, here's what I learned from it. If you drink alcohol, you smoke cigarettes, and you eat chocolate, you won't get worms. <laughs> I wrote down at the bottom of my page, after that joke, missing the point. <laughs> Missing the point. Now, the reason that I told that is because sometimes if we're not careful, when we go, we can hear things and we can listen to them and still miss the point. As a matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews that we're getting ready to go through, if you don't pay attention, you may miss the point through the book of Hebrews. There's been pastors that I've discovered that have actually skipped this book because sometimes it can be hard to explain. It can be hard to listen to, and if you don't pay attention, you'll miss the point. So today, as we get into it, I'll just give you a real quick briefing about it. The author, we're not sure who wrote the book. It's believed that it could have been Luke. It's believed that it could have been uh, Apollos. Uh, some people believe that it could have been uh, Barnabas. Some people believe that it could have been the Apostle Paul. You know, we really don't know because it doesn't say who wrote it. But we know that the most important thing, ultimately it was God who wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that gave a man to pen it down. That's the most important thing. Now the audience that the book of Hebrews was written through, they were Jewish believers. They were people that were being pulled back into Judaism. They were Jewish believers that had accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now they were starting to follow Christ, but now some religious guys were coming along and they were saying, hey, hey, if you want to become a Christian, you have to be part of the Jewish faith and you have to become a Jew in order to be a Christian. What Christ told you is only partial truth. So now these Jewish Christians are being pulled. They don't know what to do. And that's the reason for the book of Hebrews. It's kind of interesting because as we dig into it, we're going to see what some of the problems were because uh, Christianity was kind of viewed as a cult by some of these Jewish religionists. And now some of the Christians were starting to be persecuted for following Christ. You know, it's easy for us, when we accept Christ, to come here, to come sit Sunday morning in a church. But what if we had to worry about when we walked outside these doors about being killed for our faith. What about when you go home, your spouse or your family say, I can't believe you departed our faith and now you're a Christian. You're no good. You're not part of us anymore. And they actually kick you out of the family because now you're a Christian. Or maybe you go to your place of employment and now they know that you're a Christian and they fire you from your job because you're a Christian. These were some of the experiences that these new Christians were experiencing. 
They were trying to get these guys to return back to Judaism. They says, hey, you got to follow our rules. You have to follow our regulations. You have to follow our rituals. You have to follow our ceremonies in order to be a true Christian. That's what these Jewish religionists were saying to these people that were now following Christ. That would be like today, you become a Christian and somebody come up to you and they say, you know what, you can't be a real, a real Christian unless you become part of our church. You can't be a real Christian and listen to that contemporary music. You can't be a real Christian and wear a pair of jeans to church. You can't be a real Christian and just be sprinkled with baptized. you got to be dunked. Those are all things that there's churches today that say that oftentimes when a brand new believer just comes to Christ, if they're not careful, they'll get involved with the church. And this is some of the rules and regulations that a church wants to put on them. I have a friend of mine that's a pastor of a church, and he's a great brother in the Lord. I love him to death. But they actually believe unless you're baptized in his church, you're not really truly saved. Well, we know scripturally we do not believe that. Now, just because he teaches that and he believes it doesn't mean he can't be my friend. We have grace. When you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're then to learn the Word of God, what the Bible has to say, and display His grace in our lives. And these guys here now, the arguments, really starting to come in to these Christians. And these religionists, they're saying, you know what? You can't be a real Christian and do what you're doing, guys. And that brings us right into Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, who be in the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged out sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Well, we see here this author is trying to make the point that Christ is superior to the prophets. Remember, God had used many, many methods to get messages to the people in the Old Testament times. If we remember correctly, he spoke to Isaiah in visions. He spoke to Jacob in a dream. He spoke to Abraham and Moses personally. So God had many ways that he spoke to the people in the Old Testament times. Now these Jewish believers and these new Christians... They knew all these examples that he's talking about here because as a young boy growing up, you learn the Jewish tradition. So all this was part of their ways. But it's kind of interesting because they found it astonishing that God had revealed himself by speaking through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what it says there in verse 2. And these last days spoken to us by his son. So these Jewish people, they found it that very difficult to believe. So the number one reason that Christ is superior to the prophets is because Jesus is a spokesperson for God. He says it very, very clear here inside the scriptures. But the second reason is because God had willed everything to his son. It says very, very clear that he has appointed heir of all things. So Jesus has been appointed heir of all things from God. Now, how do you and I benefit by that? What does that mean to you and I? If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a child of God. As a child of God, you get to inherit the things that Jesus inherited from the Father. Now, what type of things do you and I get to inherit? Number one, forgiveness of our sins. Forgiveness of our sins. And also to have a relationship with our God. That's the difference between religion and Christianity. Religion is a man always trying to seek up to reach God. A relationship is where God reaches down to man. We know that we can't do anything on our own. We accept by grace His favor. So we see here, in other words, Jesus alone. Jesus alone inherited it. What does that mean? That Jesus is to receive and to be the lawful owner of all 
things. All things. God has gave Jesus all things. Oh, that's powerful when you think about it. Jesus has inherited all that God is and all that God has. You'll see why I'm going through this in a few minutes because I don't want us to miss the point of what we're going through and the reason that this author is writing this. So since Jesus has all the power and all the authority, if you're born again, you're able to receive this forgiveness and a relationship with God. And I like this because not only is Jesus the exact representation of God, but Jesus is God himself. Jesus is God himself. You can have no clearer view of God, who God is, than to look at the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, now listen to this. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh. And the book of John, in John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And we know that Word represents who? Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And then down verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh. It's exactly who Jesus Christ is. He is God in the flesh. God looked down at earth, seeing the predicament that mankind had put himself in. God says, I need to go down and help mankind out. So God comes down to earth in the form of a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. That is one of the things of the Christian faith that we cannot debate on. One of the things that we cannot say, okay, you believe your way and I believe my way. In the Christian faith, this is a cornerstone <laughs> that we have to believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus has an inherited all things. Some of these people, they have a hard time believing that. As a matter of fact, in John 14, 9, Jesus said, keep in mind, Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So when we hear what Jesus said, we hear what God says. When we want to observe Jesus, we observe God, or vice versa. If we want to know what God is like, if we want to know where God might go, if we want to know what God might say, all we have to do is watch the life of Jesus. And then we know exactly what God has to say to us by looking through the scriptures and reading about the life and the person of Jesus Christ. But there's another reason that Jesus has appeared to the prophets. And it says there that he is the creator. He's the maker of the worlds, of the universe. In Colossians 1.16, it says, For by him, talking about Jesus, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him, and for him. That's the key. You were created by him, and the reason you were created by him is for him. So when people want to know what their purpose is in life, you don't go reading a book outside this book. <laughs> this is the book would tell you what your life purpose is. Everybody wants to know, why, was, why am I here on earth? Why was I created? Whether you're a, a Christian or whether you're not saved. Everybody wants to know. That's why books like by uh, Rick Warren, uh, The Purpose Driven Life, also by Joel Osteen, Living Your Best Life Now, those type books that try to help people discover their purpose, and I'm not endorsing that you go out and buy them. I'm just saying, but that's why those books are such high rank uh, on the market. Is because everybody wants to know. Well, when you want to know, why did God create you? What is your purpose? You go to the scriptures. If you follow the scriptures and you do what the scriptures tell you to do and you're obedient to it, oftentimes that obedience means doing maybe not what you want to do because the scripture tells you. Through that, you will find what your purpose in life is. John 1, 3, it says, Through him all things were made. Without him... Nothing was made that has been made. So we see it doesn't matter what kind of world or what kind of creatures or what it is. There's nothing that's in existence that Christ did not create. That's so important for us to remember. Jesus created everything. He was with God in the beginning of time. 
And when it said that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father, there inside the verse 3, He didn't sit down because He was tired. <laughs> he didn't sit down because He was bored to get more directions. That word, that when it's, it means that when He sat down at the right hand of the Father, we know the right hand means what? Authority and power. He sat down because His work had been completed. He was done with it. He was finished with it. And that was the purpose of them saying that his work, his sacrifice had been accepted unto the Father. But look at verse 4. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, this is one of the key verses. Christ is superior to than angels. We just learned that Christ is superior over the prophets, but now Christ is superior over angels. Angels actually do exist. The word angel means messenger. Okay? They're magnificent beings that were created by God, they live in the spiritual realm. But they also visit you and I. And I'm going to go through a couple of things here in a few minutes about what angels, what their ministry is. The reason why I'm going to focus a little bit here. Originally, my minute, this week's message was not really so much on angels. But although I felt like the Lord guided me to speak more on angels. The reason why I've heard two comments this week on national TV. One of them that God took him about somebody famous that just died. God needed another angel, so they took him. That was what was going on at the ceremonies where everybody was giving him honor. That's what some of the people were getting up saying, that God needed another angel, so he brought him up to God and made him into an angel. <laughs> False. <laughs> The other person, they were a Charlie's angel. Now God needs them as his angel. Eh, wrong again. That's not the way the scripture reads about angels. You know, we have such a mis idea of what angels really are. You know, now angels, first of all, they had the privilege of living in God's presence. They served God day in, day out, night in, night out. That was the main reason for an angel is to worship God, first of all, but then to do the work of God. Okay, because, because of who they are, because of their high position, oftentimes people have a tendency to want to worship an angel instead of worshiping Christ. When we lived down south, we had a friend of ours that was a priest, he made a living by going out to one of the busy tourist areas and selling little angels on a necklace as a charm. This guy made more money than you could shake a stick at. He would have a cross with Jesus there next to it or an angel. And the, and the angels, so many more people bought angels than they bought the cross. And I asked him, I says, why is that? And he said, because so many people, they believe in angels, but a lot of them don't believe in Christ. And the reason is, is because a lot of people, they consider angels to be their go-between between between them and God. Hmm. So this we're going to see in this scripture, or this section of scripture, it's going to show us that Christ is superior to angels. You know, it's important to make this point here, this writer did, whoever he was, I just happen to believe it was the Apostle Paul, but I can't write that in stone, and you can have your own opinion of it. But I believe that this writer, whoever wrote it, I believe that the reason why he wrote this is because these Jewish people, they had a very high regard for the ministry of angels. Now you say, why do you say that? Because in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2, it would seem as though Moses had received the law on Mount Sinai, and it was given to him by many angels. Also, if you look over in Acts 7.53, I'll tell you what, real quick, I'll go over to Acts 7.53. I'll start out in verse 52. 
Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and the murderers. Who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it? If you go over to Galatians also, and we're not going to go there right now, but you can write down these verses. Galatians 3.19, it talks about how the Jewish people were given the law through angels. In other words, God had given the law to the angels to give to the people. So these people, they had believed that the angels were their connection with God. So that's why the Jewish people held them in such high regards. Now, it's kind of interesting because... Very often in the Old Testament times, these angelic beings, they appeared frequently throughout the history of God's people. So as perhaps these people, they were arguing with these people that had now went over into Christianity. They're saying, hey, if you go strictly over to Christianity and you lead the Jewish faith, you're no longer in our heritage because you're denying us your Jewish faith, and you're becoming a Christian. You may not have the work of angels in your life anymore. There's a possibility that they were saying that to him. But he's infinitely superior to angels, and this chapter is going to make it clear as we're going to see. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, it says that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. I don't want us to miss the point. Jesus has superiority over prophets and he also is above angels. But you know, there's those who teach not this theory here. And you say, well, who? Who today? Well, number one, the Jehovah Witnesses. How many of us know that? The Jehovah Witnesses, they teach that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. There are those who that teach that Jesus was created by the Father. Believe in this, it cheapens the sacrifice that he did on the cross. That would mean that God sent an angel to die for you. God did not do that. God sent his son to die for you, not some angel. That's not what happened at all. An angel did not die for you. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul would say, Great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifested in the flesh. It's saying that God himself took your sins and placed them on himself. It was God himself who died on the cross, not an angel. Amen. That's right, amen. Scripture's clear that Jesus was the one that died for your sins. Not Michael the archangel. Another group that we're common with today is the Mormons. The Mormons, they deny that Jesus is superior to angels. According to Mormon theology, they called Jesus and Lucifer together, and they said, hey, we need to redeem humanity. And then these two created beings, Jesus and Lucifer, they both suggested a plan. God accepted Jesus' plan over Lucifer's, so ever since that time, Lucifer has been after the ministry of Jesus Christ. This is truth, folks. Start studying on some of these things, if you're grounded in your faith, and you'll see exactly what they stand, because that way when they knock on your door, you know exactly what to say to them. They teach it Jesus and Lucifer as brothers. Since Lucifer is a fallen angel, we know that, the Bible is very clear about it, then that means that Jesus would be an angel if they were brothers, right? And this is what they teach. You know, any suggestion that Jesus is an angel is heresy. <laughs> it's not the truth. Colossians teaches that angels are not to be worshipped at Colossians 2.18. So when somebody knocks on your door or some cultist, they approach you, take them to Hebrews 1. Say to him, Jesus is not in the same category as your angels. He's, <laughs> angels are not to be worshipped. Jesus and Jesus alone is to be worshipped. That's right, amen. He alone is worthy to be praised. Look at verse 5. For to which of the angels... Now, this author is going on to prove the point that Jesus is above angels. Verse 5... 
For to who which of the angels did he ever say, talking about did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Verse 6. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Let the angels, he says, who makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. He's saying here that the Son is the one to be exhausted. Exalted, I'm sorry. The point is that God had never addressed an angel as his Son. Now, there's a couple places in the Bible where we see the angels are called sons of God. When it's used in this term, notice that it's speaking in a creature type form. Notice that when you see uh, creatures of God, and he's speaking of angel, that word S for sons is always in small letter form. It's not capitalized. But when it speaks about the Son of God, Jesus, that letter S is always in a capital form. That is how you differentiate the two between what he's talking about. So when Jesus is described as Son, that means he's equal with God. And he's spelled with the capital S. We see in verse 5 there where it says, For which angels did he ever say, You are my son? You know, he's saying right through here, this is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, 14. This author's quoting this. It's an argument is that God never spoke to an angel this way. God never said to an angel that you are my son. But in verse 6, God the Father said that Jesus was to be the object that the angels were to worship. That's very important. You never worship an angel. Jesus was not created to worship angels. The creation was just the opposite. The angels were created to worship Jesus. Now, it says there the firstborn. In Luke chapter 2, verse 7, that firstborn means a firstborn means the first and appointed time. Over in Psalms 89, verse 27. This firstborn means rank and honor. First in rank or honor. Which is the way that it's talking about here in verse 6. Jesus is the first one in rank. He is the one to be honored. God did not send an angel in the world to be his son. No, he sent Jesus into the world to be his son. Christ and Christ alone is the one and only begotten son. No angel was begotten. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that, so, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Go through and look in the scriptures and see where it says anywhere that an angel is begotten. You won't find it. That word begotten, it means born or sent into the world by God. That's what the world begotten means. To be born or to be sent into the world by God. But notice in verse 7 there it says that he makes angels. Notice that? Right there in verse 7. Who makes his angels? Angels are made. They're created by God and they're uh, controlled by God. Bless you. So Jesus Christ is God. That means that angels were controlled by their maker, Jesus Christ. When somebody makes something, they're usually the controller of it, aren't they? And that's what he's saying right through here. Look at verse 8. But to the Son, now keep in mind, he just spoke about angels. Now he's talking about to Jesus. But to the Son, notice capital S there, to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. God called Jesus God. Very interesting, isn't it? God called Jesus God. Here the author of Hebrews, he's quoting 
Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. And it made it clear that this passage referred to God the Father speaking to Jesus and saying, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. It's very, we don't want to miss the point. That's why it's so important for us to really learn the scriptures. Because if you read through this by yourself and you didn't have a commentary or, or any type of background, you would read right over this and skip right over it and not fully understand exactly what it's saying. So here we see that God called Jesus God. How much clearer could he make it? <laughs> so if God called Jesus God, how could we call him anything else? You and I. How could we call Jesus any other thing other than God? So we're going to see repeatedly in the book of Hebrews that tells us that Jesus is God in the flesh in this book of Hebrews. Jesus is to be worshipped as God. He's to be praised as the creator. He's to be recognized as the ruler. And he's to be glorified as God's only son. Amen? Amen. That's right. Praise the Lord. Look at verse 10. And... You, O Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak, and you will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. So here we see that he's still quoting the Old Testament as proof here that Jesus is in a different category than the angels. This author that, who, that wrote this verse through here, he's uh, referring to Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27, concerning the Son, Jesus. Basically what it's saying right through here in our everyday language, in the beginning you laid the foundation of the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains, the oceans, the lakes, the rivers. And even when they're gone, and it's going to be like an old garment folded up, and got rid of or replaced, you're still going to be here. You were here, you created it, and when they're gone, Lord, you're still going to be here. Now that shows right there that Jesus is God also. He has no beginning, no end. No beginning, no end. Hmm, that's pretty powerful when you think about that. In verse 13 there, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? He said that to the Lord, hasn't he? God said that to Jesus, sit at my right hand. But he's never said that to an angel. In that verse, God invites the Messiah, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. But he's never said that to an angel. No, never. To be seated at the right hand, we said earlier, it signifies a position of honor, of the highest honor. So therefore, the only person that you and I are ever to look up to is the Lord Jesus. Jesus ought to be the focus of your attention and my attention. No other man, not your pastor, not any political leader. Jesus is to be the focus that's who you and I are to look to for salvation, but also to look to for our daily needs and our daily trials, temptations, things that we go through in life. That's who we are to look to. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, I like that how he says that right through here. He's going to take all his enemies. How many of us know that Jesus has a lot of enemies? <laughs> so he says right here that he's going to take all his enemies... And use them as a footstool. That's universal. Submission. All over. Heaven. Earth. Below. Everyone is going to... Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess what? Jesus, Jesus is Lord. That's right. That's right. And when they do that, guess what happens? Everything and everyone is going to come under His control. Everything. Everything. Look at verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who inherit salvation? This is a very, very important verse. You know, it's interesting because angels are everywhere, as I said earlier. They've been in best-selling books 
about angels? There's entire stores that sell nothing but angels. I don't know too many stores that just, for their entirety, sell things about Jesus. But I can take you into bookstores where there's nothing in that entire, I won't even call it a bookstore, just Christian stores. Everything in that store is all angels. Angels are nothing more than servants. <laughs> Who are they to serve? You and I and God. That's who they're here to serve. Now, this verse right through here, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister those who inherit salvation? This can be looked at a couple of different ways. First, angels, are they to minister to those who are not yet converted? Good question, isn't it? Keep in mind, sometimes people have a family member or a loved one that passes away. Maybe they were never in their lives that you're aware of have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But I believe with all my heart that they can be on their deathbed. And I believe that the Lord, God Himself, can arrange for that person to be ministered to. They could send a doctor in that room. They could send a nurse in that room. They can get a dream. They can get some type of special visitation. But you and I don't know who we're going to meet in heaven. That's why the scriptures say that we're going to see people there we don't know, and we're going to see or that we didn't think would be there, and we're going to see people that we didn't think would be there. Because I believe right up to the person takes their last breath, I believe that there's room for salvation. Because God says that He desires that no one shall perish. How many times have we read in the books where God sent an angel that gave a special visitation to somebody to bring the Lord's message? I believe in all my heart that just because you and I may not see the outward appearance of somebody's salvation that that person could still be saved right up until they take their last breath. That's why it's oftentimes when I speak to people and they say, well, I don't know if my husband or my wife or whoever it may be is saved. And I'll say, you know what? Have hope. Have hope that you may see them again in heaven. That's what you and I are to have is hope. Do you all catch that a little bit? And I believe that with all my heart. Now also, this could mean to help the believers... To help the believers that are still on earth. This verse here. I believe you can take it both ways. So, if this is, these angels are to help the believers who inherit salvation or have inherited salvation, and that means the angels are over us, guess what you have? A guardian angel. Why should we be surprised at that? I'm not surprised. Not at all. You know, keep in mind, it's certain that evil spirits, according to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, there are certain evil spirits who wage unceasing conflict against God's elect. Those of you that have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, who are you? You're God's elect. You've accepted Him as your Lord and Savior. Now, let me ask you a question. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, do you think that the devil leaves you alone? <laughs> How many of us know that? So we know that he's constantly waging warfare against you. So I believe, and the Scripture teaches it, that God's angels are there fighting on your behalf. There's war going on that you and I are not visible that we can't see. Boy, there's all types of places in the scriptures where, and, and I forgot is that my mind just went blank, but there's a place where these, these, uh, all these soldiers, the enemy was coming against them. And the, and the guy that was on the good guy, the good, on the good side, he asked the Lord, he says, Lord, give that guy there a vision of your warfare around the camp. And he seen, he gave, gave that guy a special vision, and he looked up, and there, God's angels were standing all around the campfire waiting for the opposition to come. It's powerful when you think about that. So, what are some of the things that angels do? Psalm 
Psalm 91, 11. We read that they do protective work. They guard you and I. In Luke 15, we see angels rejoicing over saved sinners. Did you know that when a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, it says all the angels in heaven are rejoicing over one lost person that come to know the Lord. Think about that. That's another thing that they do. They rejoice. So they protect. They rejoice. Luke chapter 16, it says that they carry people to their eternal state. And Acts chapter 5 and chapter 12, they delivered Peter and some of the other apostles from prison. Remember that? These are angels. Also angels, they bring good news. They announced the birth of our Lord and they announced the birth of John the Baptist. Angels do a lot. A lot more than what you and I give them credit for. Angels, they encourage Paul when he was in the midst of a shipwreck. Several times, angels visited the Apostle Paul and they said to the Apostle Paul, don't be afraid, Paul. Don't be afraid. Now, let me ask you a question. If Paul was not afraid, would they say, don't be afraid? <laughs> it showed that the Apostle Paul was human like you and I. Even though he's one of the greatest men in the Bible, he was still human like you and I. There was times when he got discouraged. There was times when he got afraid. There was the times when he didn't know what to do. And yet these angels, they come alone. They said, Paul, don't be afraid. Everything's going to be okay. And that's when Paul got up and said to the other guys on the boat, don't worry, tonight an angel visited me. And he says, that we will all be safe, providing that none of you try to go your own way and jump over the ship. But God also uses his angels, as there's so many scriptures in the Bible, to execute his judgment on the unrighteous. I could give you like 10 or 12 scripture verses, you know, where God used angels to execute his judgment. But angels also have a role to fulfill even after the death of a believer. Remember over in Luke chapter 16, verse 22. Remember when the beggar died? And he was carried by the angels right in Abraham's bosom. So we see the angels do have a ministry. They're servants. They're not lords. I want us to understand that. I don't want us to miss the point of this chapter 1. Christ is superior to the prophets. Christ is superior to the angels. But we see they do have a ministry, and it's good to recognize the significance of their ministry that they have. But when any overemphasis on it should not be desired from a Christian. Not at all. That's why Colossians chapter 2, it says, there's a warning concerning the worship of angels. Our focus is to be on Jesus Christ and on Him alone, for only He is worthy to be praised. Amen? Amen. That's right. Now, in closing here, <laughs> that's like last week, that's like, yeah, 10 more minutes. That's like last week, the Apostle Paul, uh, a couple weeks ago, he said, and finally, like he's getting ready to close out his letter to the Philippians, he was only on, starting chapter 3, he was only halfway done. He still had more to go, and he said, and finally. That's why she made that comment. Did you get your email? We all have email service in here. One day God was looking down at earth, and he saw all the behavior that was going on. So God called his angels over to him, and he sent the angel to earth for a time. When, when the angel returned, they said to God, yes, it's very bad on earth. 95% are misbehaving, and only 5% are good. God thought for a moment, and he said, well, maybe I better send down a second angel to get another opinion. So God called another angel, and he sent him to earth for a time. And when the angel returned, he went to God and he said, yes, it's true. Earth is in a decline. 95% are misbehaving, but 5% are being good. God was not pleased. So he decided to email the 5% who were being good because he wanted to encourage them to give them a little something to help keep them going. 
Do you know what he said in the email? <laughs> uh, did you get that? <laughs> oh, you didn't get the email? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a man was wa- <laughs> a man was walking in the street when he heard a voice stop stand still if you take one more step a brick will fall down on your head and kill you the man stopped and a big brick fell right in front of him the man was astonished he went on after a while he was going across the road and once again a voice shouted stop stand still if you take one more step a car will run you over and you're going to die the man did as he was instructed, and just as the car came, careening, down, or careening around the corner, barely missing him. Where are you? The man asked, and who are you? I am your guardian angel, the voice answered. Oh, yeah, the man asked. And where were you on the day that I got married? <laughs> One more. Well, as we're talking about angels. Three men were in a boat. Three guys were fishing in a lake one day when an angel appeared in the boat. When the three astonished men had settled down enough to speak, the first guy asked the angel humbly, I've suffered from back pain ever since I took shrap metal in the Vietnam War. Could you help me? Of course, the angel said, and when he touched the man's back, the man felt relief for the first time in years. The second guy, who wore very thick glasses and had a hard time reading and driving, he asked the angel, he says, could you do anything about my poor eyesight? The angel smiled, removed the man's glasses, and he tossed them into the lake. When they hit the water, the man's eyes cleared, and he could see everything perfectly and distinctly. When the angel turned to the third guy, the guy put his hands out defensively. Don't touch me, he cried. I'm on a disability pension. (laughs) Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer.